Hi, I'm Lexi and this is Hannah and we're Wild About Conservation. This is the podcast where we explore the world of conservation through discussions with our very knowledgeable guests. And in this season, our focus is on all things ocean. In this episode, we chat to an inspirational photographer, producer and documentary filmmaker, Ian Rowan. He shares his insight and explains how the use of media can be a tool for social change. He shares stories of his travels around the world and a near decade long mission to show the world that narwhals are in fact real. We learn an awful lot chatting to Ian today, not only about his career so far, but we appreciated the chance to learn more about the process behind the creation of the upcoming documentary, The Narwhal's Wake. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast. Please remember to leave a review, get in touch on Twitter, or if you would like to support us as creators, we do have a Patreon. You can check out all of the links in the show notes on our website. Enjoy! Hi, thank you for chatting to us today. So can you firstly introduce yourself to our listeners, who you are, your pronouns, what you do, and your key interest in conservation? My name is Ian Rowan, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. Uh, I go by he or him. And I got into conservation through uh, a love of marine wildlife and growing up on a sailboat in Central America when I was a kid and being surrounded by whales and dolphins. And then over the course of my life, learning about different animals that were uh, had threatened ecosystems and searching for different ways that I can make an impact to help protect these animals. That sounds amazing. So you're here today to talk to us about a particular project, but I'm sure we'll learn a lot more about you along the way. Um, But before we do that, we do like to play a short game with our guests. It's a really fun quick fire round of a couple of questions just to keep you on your toes, um, if you're happy to play with us. So firstly, if you could be any animal, what would it be? I think a spirit animal of mine is a a fox. Um, I find that they're intelligent and very good at uh, what they do. Beautiful animals. And yeah, there's so many different types of foxes that live in different ecosystems. And yeah, the Arctic snow fox uh, or the Arctic fox is uh, one of my favorites. That is a particularly charismatic species. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me something that you're grateful for today? Today, I'm super grateful, like every day, to be alive and to be so blessed to live in nature. Um, I'm staring at uh, old growth trees right now on a creek and surrounded by moss and Uh, all the living creatures that get to play in this beautiful riparian habitat. Oh my gosh, that sounds wonderful. (laughs) And finally, if you could fly, breathe underwater or hibernate, what would it be? I do love to sleep, so I've already got hibernation um, (laughs) licked. Um, It'd probably be great to breathe underwater just to be able to really spend... uh, more time um not disturbing uh any species with you know i know narwhals are are quite uh skittish around uh, scuba tanks and the bubbles so being able to breathe and swim with some narwhals would be underwater would be amazing absolutely ian i love your answers so much and I have to say, usually I wait to the end of the podcast to gush a little bit. Um, We've been so excited to chat to you and I can already feel just from your answers so far, it's going to be such a wholesome episode. I'm just so excited. Um, But finally, before we start that, every episode we ask our guests how they get wild about conservation. So what do you do to get wild about conservation, that is? What do I do to get wild about conservation? Um... I guess I, I lean into 
kind of a mindset of anything is possible. And so, you know, finding myself in the Arctic with narwhals or um, just thinking uh, and having fun and uh, celebrating uh, the world and being alive uh, is my way of getting wild and thinking and doing literally anything is possible. I think you're absolutely right that anything is possible if you set your mind to it. And I think generally all we want to do is make the world a better place, but along the way experience some wonderful things. And I'm really excited to get into a little bit more about your experience. So you mentioned to us that you grew up with whales and stuff in the Pacific Ocean. Have you always been fascinated by these water habitats? Well, yeah, my father built a sailboat actually started before I was born. And then when I was three years old, the sailboat was launched. And so I literally, you know, grew up on a boat until I was 12 in the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Caribbean. So I've seen like at a young age, you know, I saw whales on, on the daily mass dolphin migrations where the entire like horizon around our sailboat was covered with frolicking dolphins and you know our our food source was also the sea we would we would fish um daily for our dinner and go exploring reefs nearby and snorkeling and spear fishing for dinner and so always having such a visceral and very uh, tangible rela- relationship to the natural world. I've, I was also a very uh, precocious kid. The other thing about growing up on a sailboat is that you have a lot of time. So you're like maybe sailing mm-hmm. to the next port and it can be like three weeks at sea. And so you learn to fill up your time with something. And my mom was a ed- educator. <laughs> and uh, so sh- we had a pretty good library on the sailboat. And so at a very young age, I just started reading. Like at five, I, I five or six, I just learned how to read and read every book in the library over the next year or two. And then really got into Jacques Cousteau and his series of books on whales, dolphins, and sharks. And so I knew, you know, a lot of different species that existed but weren't uh, in the ecosystem that I was growing up in. And so I've always just been fascinated about learning uh, more about the natural world. That's such an amazing level of immersion at such a young age. And I can see how that's just shining through all the way through everything you've probably then done because they are certainly memories that you'll never forget. So how did you go from loving the sea to photography, writing, directing, producing kind of media, I guess, as an all-encompassing word? Yeah, so my love with uh, literature eventually, you know, manifested in college and I studied a lot of English literature and got into... uh, my dad had an old Nikon camera, and so he gifted that to me, and I got into you know, uh, photography and developing uh, my own film in college. And a friend of mine uh, produced and shot his own feature film while we were in college, just on a shoestring budget around the world, and so I helped with that a little bit. And then got into the magazine world after college, and... Uh, worked for Men's Journal, which is a environmental um, magazine. It's uh, under Jan Wenner of uh, Rolling Stone. So they have some really hard-hitting environmental pieces, and it was about you know, adventure travel. And so I saved up mm-hmm. some money and uh, bought a motorcycle and did a motorcycle trip revisiting all the places I grew up on the sailboat and the families. And so through through that experience, I I got to, you know, it, although it was over land, I you know 
was on the water quite a bit uh, during that trip and ended up um, creating a, a, a blog about it called Not the Motorcycle Diaries. And it was uh, Che Guevara with a no smoking sign through him because it was my brother and I on a motorcycle journey <laughs> uh, through Central America and South America. And through that, I did a lot of filming and got some sponsorship and um, kind of translated that to uh, to film and edited some videos and then got into more uh, of the documentary world through another friend who's actually the mm. director of photography for the Narwhal's Wake. Uh, Peter Mihalovich was working with a director by the name of Cynthia Wade, who's won a couple or won, been nominated for like three Oscars, won a one. So I started filming as a camera person, camera assistant with her uh, on various projects around the world, um, including one that just came out and is winning a lot of awards right now um, called Grit. Um and so, yeah, this from that experience, uh, I decided, you know, I can do anything. And so I embarked on uh, this Narwhal documentary. That sounds like such an amazing journey to have gone from an interest in literature. And then you can really see the stepping stone and the foundations that you built to be who you are today and I can see how you've created the projects that you have thus far so you already mentioned it but the project that we've got you on today to talk about is the narwhals wake so can we ask you first why narwhals in particular because like you said the natural world is full of so many amazing things what why particularly this species well it's kind of funny because a lot of people don't know that narwhals are even real <laughs> um so having grown up with the Jacques Cousteau books, I, of course, knew that narwhals were real and had seen photos and knew a bit about their life cycle. And going through my life every once in a while, I would talk about narwhals because, let's admit, they are amazing creatures. And oftentimes I would be, uh, you know, my, the response I would get would be, <clears throat> um, you know, why are you talking about narwhals as if they're real? You know that they are mythological creatures <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> people think they're extinct or don't exist or uh, what have you. So through that, I, I created something called Keep Narwhals Real. And I did some um, some man on the street interviews, just checking to see, like, how many people actually know that these animals are real. Um, and it turns out in my experience, I used to say it was like, 20% of people, but it's more like 35% of people that I meet either haven't heard of them, think they're extinct, or think they're mythological creatures. So I did want to disabuse people of uh, that fallacy. They are indeed real, and they're very magical creatures that, because they're so strange and so seemingly magical, people think they're not real. And they're known as, you know, the unicorns of the sea. So I think there's a transitive property of that, the myth of the unicorn uh, passing over to the narwhal and people don't think they're real. When in fact, the narwhal is actually the origin of the myth of the unicorn. So that's a bit of, that's a, another little story that uh, is, is more along the lines of some knowledge. I love how these kind of myths and things connect. i quite shocked to have to say at that number of like roughly 35 percent of people not thinking that narwhals are real um but just to really paint a picture for our listeners in case they've not been so exposed to a narwhal what is a narwhal a narwhal is a cetacean a whale that is most closely related to the beluga whale and only only lives in the arctic so only in baffin bay and off of the Svalbard Islands. And so that's kind of both sides of Greenland. And Baffin Bay separates Greenland and northern Canada in the Arctic. And so they're a whale that has a very strange evolutionary trait, whereas they have a tusk 
which is actually a tooth that uh, protrudes through their left lip and can grow to be uh, about 10 feet long. So they're a very strange whale and very adapted to their environment and rarely seen unless you go to the Arctic or uh, come across some Nat Geo photos or something. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of other interesting qualities, but uh, yeah, they live on top of the, of the earth and have a, uh, a symbiotic kind of relationship with the Inuit and yeah. I love the fact that your driver for the narwhal was this myth debunking mission of they do exist and then you've come to learn so much more about them. I've got a really quick question. I hope it's an easy one to answer. Do all narwhals have these tusks? Not all narwhals uh, express the tusk. Um, everyone can. And genetically, they actually uh, have the capability of expressing teeth in their mouth. And they've sh they shut off that gene. And the tusk uh, starts to grow um, through their lip, actually. So, you know, a unicorn has uh, a horn coming out of its forehead, but a narwhal, uh, a real creature, um, it has the tusk coming <laughs> out uh, through the left lip, and the right lip uh, as well has a smaller tusk. And those, um, there can be expressions. It's like two to maybe three or four percent of the population of narwhals are double tusked. And so they have two 10 foot tusks. Um, males and females uh, both display the tusk and not all narwhals uh, actually display the tusk. And that's not understood why. Um, there, some theories have been that you know, they, it's for mating or breaking holes in the ice and uh, fighting and that sort of thing. But uh, in reality, it's, it's really not. It's a sense organ and you wouldn't use it to break ice because it could break. And they're actually very careful with the tusk. Um, it's not used as a weapon. I picked up on a few things there from what you said that's now got my mind running. Lexi's looking at me because I won for going off on tangents. Because that you literally answered the question that I was about to ask was, do they break? But what you've just said there is that they're actually sensory. And I think walruses' tusks are also kind of in the same way used for some sensory purposes. So are the tusks for feeding? And if not, how do narwhals hunt? Yeah, so it's actually quite fascinating. Um, one of the the people in my film, Dr. Nawia, is a... Uh, Harvard mm. professor of dentistry. And so he's been studying the narwhals on expeditions for the Explorers Club for the past decade plus. And he does live capture of narwhals and then tests out different uh, saline and water temperature solutions uh, by putting a, a bag around their tusk and monitoring their heart rates and their brains. So the it's very much a tooth. So if we think about it uh, from a human mammalian perspective, you know, our teeth, we think of as like, you know, hard biting things that we chew our food with. But, you know, when you have something really cold or taste, you know, uh, or, or something metal in your mouth or something like that, your tooth uh, is very sensitive. It has a nerve in it. And that nerve, uh, you know, gives us information. So if things are really cold or you have a toothache, that's all, you know, coming literally through the tooth. It's actually a porous membrane. Um, so that's the same thing with the narwhal's tusk. There's uh, millions of nerves in this 10-foot tusk. And each, uh, there's millions of little holes in the in the tusk or tooth and they can sense the temperature and the salinity of the water so so if you so you can imagine that like if we broke off our tooth and our nerve was exposed it would be incredibly painful so narwhals mm -hmm. also 
you know, don't want their um, tusk broken. So they don't use it as a weapon. They don't use it to poke through ice. Not that they could because, you know, Arctic sea ice is, you know, 10 feet or 20 feet or whatever it is. If you try and do an ice pick to that, uh, you'll probably not get through and wear yourself out in the process. So what they actually use the tusk for is um, feeding uh, or sensing uh, underwater. So if you can imagine um, the Arctic where you're feeding under sea ice, uh, it can be very dark there. The narwhal is the second deepest diving whale in the world. So it goes down a mile and a half underwater to feed. And that is very dark down there. So the narwhal uses the tusk to sense uh, maybe for prey, though that's not confirmed. Um, And then they they flip upside down to feed on Arctic char and squid and things like that. And then uh, they have to come back up for air. And so this is where the tusk really comes into play. Um, It is dark and cold a mile and a half down. They have around roughly 28 minutes of of being able to hold their breath. And so when they come back up, they need to go straight to a hole in the ice to be able to breathe. And so if you can imagine how sea ice forms, um, all this fresh water is created and that drops all this salt, the saline. And so where there's thick ice, it's very reasonable to assume that there's a lot of uh, saline uh, rich water where there's large sea ice. And then also if there's a hole in the ice, um, then probably the sun is getting to it. And so it has maybe a higher temperature. And so the narwhal will use its tusk to find fresher water that is less saline and warmer, and it follows those currents all the way up with its tusk, and then pops out and breathes. That's an amazing use of a tooth. (laughs) My teeth aren't that useful. That's insane. (laughs) So obviously you've mentioned that they live generally around Baffin Bay. What type of temperature is that for them? How, like, what's the temperature of the Arctic water? So yeah, the the water is, you know, it's the Arctic, so it's cold year round, uh, much colder in the winter months when there's literally no sun for about three months and perpetual darkness. And so during those months uh, in the Arctic, they the narwhals have a migratory route. So they head south to the tip uh, of Greenland and the end of Baffin Bay uh, in kind of mid-Canada there. Um, There are two populations of narwhals. So the other population, um, it migrates to the Svalbard Islands, which are some islands uh, northeast of Greenland. And so in the summer months, they migrate back up to the Arctic Circle, and the two populations intermix. Um, And it's, you know, Moving water is generally quite cold, but it can be salt water can, uh, you know, be below freezing. And the narwhals really use their blubber and they have quite large stores of fat around them to keep them warm. They are very well suited to those temperatures. Uh, A narwhal has never been kept in captivity. And it's probably due to the need for um, the colder temperatures and uh, sea ice conditions. Once there was a narwhal that was brought from the Arctic down to Coney Island and kept in an aquarium, um, but it didn't last very long, um, likely due to captivity and, uh, and the aquarium water temperature not being quite cold enough they have very like uh sensitive skin as well their outer layers Mm -hmm. uh they're actually known uh narwhal the name actually comes from the vikings that hunted the narwhals in the svalbard islands and so narwhal actually translates in norse 
as a corpse whale. So they have really mottled skin that's like a blotchy black and white. And so the Vikings uh, likened it to a corpse floating in the water. So it's that's where Narval comes from. Imagine having the knowledge that you are being called a floating corpse <laughs> from <laughs> the other creatures that are observing and around you. Um, you've actually you just got me thinking there about because obviously they're living in these quite cold waters, and one of the things in kind of marine ecology that I don't want to say rule because there aren't rules in nature really, um, but the the colder the water is, things tend to be slower growing. Like Greenland sharks, they tend to get quite old. So what is the average lifespan of a narwhal? And obviously, as you've just said, that would never be reached in captivity, potentially, especially seen as the one that did end up in captivity didn't survive very long. Narwhals being uh, endemic and native to the Arctic uh, are incredibly hard to study. Um, It requires long amounts of time on the flow edge, camping out, or really high technology needs that are quite expensive to be able to track and uh, learn more about the narwhals. So there's still a lot of science to be done, Um, but generally uh, the lifespan is, uh, has been estimated to be around 50 years. And do you know much about their reproduction and their kind of life cycle? So you've already, already mentioned this migratory route that they take but is there anything else you can tell us about what we can expect over their life so it's not really certain you know if the if the tusk plays a large role in mating and reproduction um but females Mm -hmm. um usually give birth to a single calf and rare cases uh sometimes uh two um and I, the mating usually occurs in spring uh around april and as you can imagine that's with a lot of animals um and the warmer waters are getting a bit warmer they'll have better feeding uh during the summer months in order to provide for the calf and um, the gestation period is almost uh, uh, a little bit, uh, almost a year. It's uh, the following July is usually when um, the, the calves are born. And uh, obviously they, like most whales, they live in pods. So there's a hierarchy and the, the calves are usually stay within that pod until it's time for them to mate and then they'll maybe uh, find another pod to keep the probably the the genetics of a you know quite uh isolated um populations so that's one reason why they theorize that the svalbard population and the baffin bay population uh mix in the spring up uh, in the Arctic uh, or in the Arctic Circle is in order to keep the the genetic um, population more diverse. Yeah, you can certainly imagine, bearing in mind, I've never really given much thought until kind of we've been chatting more about this that because I don't work on narwhals, I work on something very different. Um, to me, they're just off in the Arctic somewhere, but as to where they actually are, I've never really thought of it too much. So yeah, you can definitely see how those populations could become quite genetically similar if they were so isolated from each other. So that's quite interesting that there's maybe that mixing there. Um, have you ever actually seen a narwhal calf yourself? I've seen some like adolescents. I, I've i been with narwhals on the flow edge in the Arctic uh, with uh, the Inuit. Um but uh, yeah, like adolescents and adults are a lot easier to spot. Um, a, they're bigger, and so you can see them pop up a bit. 
Um, <laughs> and they'll have their tusks up out of the water. Um, whereas calves will, uh, probably, you know, stay closer to their mothers and breathe when their mothers breathe. So they can be behind, uh, depending on the vantage point and the view. Um, and narwhals also tend to, um, when they're swimming, they take turns at the surface. And so there's a, a line of narwhals uh, below and one will be at the surface. And that, that behavior makes sense since they, they're in open waters at times, but a lot of the times they're uh, going through these uh, flow edges, uh, cracks between uh, sea ice, and those can be, you know, a few feet uh, wide. So they take turns coming up to breathe and stay in the pod. That sounds amazing. So what was it like for you seeing your first narwhal or seeing a narwhal at all? And knowing they were real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really hit home that they were real when I uh, really saw them. Um, it was, you know, I was camping out for like a week on the flow edge with Inuit and we were just waiting for the migration to come through. And you never know if they're going to come through this certain area this year or not. So it was just a waiting game where you had to be at peace with the possibility that indeed you you would not see them. Um, so the day mm. that the call came through the radios that the narwhals were indeed coming through and I was... Uh, brought out by another uh, Inuit on the back of his sled and saw the narwhal for the first time. I just, because it had been such a long journey to get up there, and I'm not talking about the three plane rides and the, you know, it's pretty hard to get up to the, uh, <laughs> to the, you know, North, uh, uh, North Pole or the, the, polar region <laughs> um but it was the years leading up to it i've been working on this project for a long time now and to be standing on the snow and looking at a narwhal and uh, a narwhal's eye into their eye was uh, quite profound and just i felt uh, like a wave of gratitude to be you know humbly seeing this animal in the wild. Um, so, yeah, it really hit home that indeed they're real and they do have a, a very magical presence that uh, compels one to um, care for them and protect them and vouchsafe their continued ex existence on this earth. I think that's just beautiful thinking about those first moments that you saw those narwhals. Also, I realize that Lexi keeps squirming next to me and it's because you're talking about cold things and she doesn't like cold things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I can't even begin to imagine. I need that so much stuff before those moments. So you must have a favorite narwhal fact or are they just, you know, every fact's a favorite? Well, it's, it, they're not narwhal facts. They're, uh, it's called narledge. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you say that earlier and I was like, knowledge? And now I see what you're saying. I love a pun. I, that would be my favorite pun ever. That's amazing. That's a little one I came up with. Oh, All right, what's yeah. your favorite knowledge? I've got a lot of narledge. <laughs> um, there's a few uh, favorite ones. Um, I think probably the one of the better ones is, well, first off, they they also do use the tusk to stun fish and prey. So they'll, it's only oh, been wow. seen once uh, by Western um, scientists, but the Inuit have always said that they display this behavior where they'll come up on a, a school of small fish and they'll take their tusk out of the water and then bop it on their heads and stun them and just come over and uh, eat the fish whole. But my favorite bit of narledge is really that the narwhal is a dentist. <laughs> and yeah, and what do I mean by that? 
Um, this has never been uh, recorded in the wild, but is known to have happened. And then the exact mechanics are unknown, but um, a narwhal will oftentimes be hunted by orcas or sometimes by humans and polar bears are another one. But the orcas and uh, drive narwhals uh, towards shallow water. They kind of herd them to in their hunt. And so narwhals being the second mm-hmm. deepest diving whale, their initial uh, escape mechanism is to be like, hey, I'm just going to you know, go a mile and a half underwater and those orcas can't get down to me. Um, but since they've been penned in to the beach or to a shallow area, sometimes in their panic, they'll swim down and they'll hit the ground and break off their tusk. And this is incredibly oh. painful, I can imagine with millions of nerve endings and then salt water rushing in. Um, what can a narwhal do, right? Um, they... Well, it sounds pretty devastating. Yeah, they really need to plug that hole somehow. And so another narwhal will come up and because the tip of the tusk is actually solid um, tooth, uh, the it's probably like four or five inches back is where the nerve endings are uh, the tip of the nerve endings. And so a narwhal will come over and somehow plug uh, the hole with its tusk into the other tusk that's broken. And this is the mechanics that they don't know how it happens, but somehow the, the narwhals are able to break off their tusk and plug the hole. And then the other narwhal is able to slowly drain that salt water out through its head and through its body. And then a narwhal uh, is all fixed. Uh, no Novocaine, sadly. Um, but it gets to swim off with a uh, essentially a, a, a filling and uh, continue its existence and use of its tusk. So this has only ever been seen by hunters, uh, the Inuit. And so there's a few examples of tusks with these uh, uh, plugs of other narwhal tusks in them in a few different museums in Northern Europe. Um, so yeah, that's, I would say that's my favorite bit of knowledge, like a, a literal like dentist of nature and kind of is fitting since they have such a large tooth and such a strange tooth that uh, <laughs> that they're able to do some dentistry. Um, I don't know of any other animal that uses like a, a process like that, um, but it's definitely quite singular. No, that's absolutely insane and amazing. And I think it speaks to the familial bonds that these um massive cetaceans have like there's a lot of different mammals that if one is injured they would just be left but the fact that these cetaceans these narwhals have this need to help one another to ensure survival is just amazing and the fact that they can be dentists has just (laughs) blown my mind a little bit and you've already mentioned that one of their natural predators and something that causes a little issue is orcas but could you tell us a little bit more about the other threats that they face well sure um climate change would be one of them that's a a bigger uh can of uh, worms to open um but certainly climate change human predation and uh like i said orcas killer whale otherwise known as killer whales um, and polar bears and polar bears, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, a cool, uh, little fact, but like literally, uh, polar bears hang out around a uh, Polinia, which is, uh, the indigenous name for a hole in the ice. And they'll wait for a narwhal to pop up for a breath and then they will bear hug them. And oh, that bear hug is, you know, kind of, t- kind of not the bear hug you really want. 
and they'll bring the yep. narwhal out of the water if they can. Um, and then the other predation is uh, the Inuit actually hunt the narwhal for sustenance. And it's a very important relationship in the north and uh, one that is actually quite integral to the continued existence and the existence at all of the Inuit in that uh, they, they really covet the blubber. They eat the whole animal, mm. of course, but when they hunt the narwhal, it's really for their blubber. And it's a really fascinating um, uh, relationship to that blubber. It's called muktuk, and they share it between the entire village. Um, so they go on these hunts. They have quota systems now in Canada where each village gets X amount uh, according to their hamlet population. And uh, that's another really fascinating bit of knowledge is that the blubber of the narwhal is super high in vitamin C. So through their diet, they are, uh, you know, kind of apex predators. And so vitamin C builds up in their blubber. And seals also have some vitamin C, but it's really the narwhal that has a lot. And if you can imagine, um, have you ever seen an Inuit or any depiction of people living in the north biting on oranges or having lemons or limes? That is never the case, they'd be right? Frozen. <laughs> yeah, they'd be frozen. <laughs> and not grow up there. So if we can also liken this to um, you know, the days of pirates and seafaring, what was a common uh, occurrence on ships where you know, the sailors would die from the lack of... Vitamin C, you've got to prevent that scurvy. Right, so scurvy is a, you know, a vitamin uh, C deficiency and you die from it. If you're uh, not taking in any vitamin C. And so the Inuit may not have survived without their reliance on the narwhal and its blubber. And so, you know, if, if the theory is correct of the land bridge and people coming from Asia over to North America and then populating downwards, that initial populating downwards, you know, took thousands of years and generations. And so they had to survive in the Arctic and in the North before the Americas could get populated. So perhaps the, the, the vitamin C in the blubber of the narwhal is what uh, allowed these people to uh, survive in the Arctic. And it may be one of the underlying, underlying causes for um, you know, a human population in North America and South America. That's really fascinating, this connection of that indigenous culture to the land and how, you know, it differs everywhere how human populations have persevered and survived. And thinking about exactly that kind of juxtaposition of, well, there's no oranges, so where where do the vitamins come from? Um, other than the natural predation and also hunting, are there any other human threats that narwhal populations are experiencing? Yeah, there's a very um, salient uh, human threat, and this derives from uh, Arctic oil exploration. Mm. Um, it's estimated that there are about 1.9 trillion barrels of oil under the Arctic Sea. And so there's a lot of pressure um, from different countries and uh, different corporations uh, from from various uh, different nationalities that are surveying and uh, trying to get the most accurate maps possible to then uh, auction those off or sell them to the oil companies. And that uh, process is called a seismic uh, survey, uh, and the seismic refers to this process of these uh, large, 
large ships that carried this array of seismic devices behind them. And these are, it's, it's for se seismic blasting. And it's literally um, the loudest man-made noise on earth. The only thing that is louder is a atomic bomb. Oh, wow. So it's uh, something that engineers and scientists have uh, constructed these pneumatic um, canisters that uh, explode <clears throat> uh, pressurized air underwater and and it's about 260 ish decibels uh, the human human hearing we can only withstand 90 decibels and then we go deaf mm -hmm. um, so if you imagine an array of say 40 of these uh, seismic devices go off every 10 seconds 24 hours a day as they're towed behind these ships up and down uh, different uh, areas of the Arctic. And so that can cause, you know, if a marine mammal or a cetacean, or in this case, a narwhal is uh, near, uh, like say very close to one of those seismic blastings, um, it, it would, the pressure waves would liquefy and just destroy most organs further away deafen uh, so those waves would be uh, too strong for their ears to withstand and then uh, further than that uh, sound also carries very well underwater and very differently so a seismic blast off of ireland can be heard off of north carolina so it traverses the entire ocean and can also reverb in uh, in bays. Um, but these these sounds uh, so so perpetuate underwater that uh, the migratory patterns or no, it doesn't even have to be a migratory pattern. It could be, just be a feeding ground. A narwhal or any whale is going to try to avoid these sounds. And so that may be well and good in a tropical setting or the Pacific. Um, but in the Arctic, if you uh, change your migratory patterns and uh, what narwhals do is they'll, they'll go into fjords and they'll go into bays where the sound uh, is hopefully not reverbing and making it into there as strong. But those bays also have changing sea ice and can can become frozen over. Mm -hmm. And so there have been mass uh, strandings of narwhals that can't make it to another hole in the ice or the ice freezes over and they suffocate and can't feed. And uh, there have been instances of more than 300 narwhal uh, not surviving because they've changed their migratory pattern to avoid these seismic surveys. Yeah, I think I'm just taking a moment to take all the information in because we've um, also had a chat with a couple of other people about the effects of sound pollution in our waters just from boats and these massive like cruise ships and oil tankers and stuff. And that's having a detrimental impact on so much marine life. And I didn't even realize these seismic surveys were going on until we got in contact with you. And just the way that you put it there has just really hit my heart massively because it does make you question why is the exploration of oil so important when we do have other renewable options at the moment, when it's having such a detrimental impact on some of these animals. Yeah, there's quite a bit of geopolitical um, influence on it. Um, these systems uh, have been in place and perpetuate themselves uh, to a large degree. And it, the other thing is it's happening way out in the ocean. No one really sees it, you know? The industry knows about it. Like, I'd never heard of seismic blasting for oil. Um, there's lots of these ships out there and lots of these surveys are going on uh, all over the, the place and not enough research has been done 
around the detrimental effects, but a lot of papers are starting to come out of how it, these seismic blasts are, it's, it's hard to imagine, but like the water actually like liquefies above these things. It's just a massive, massive blast. And so it's been shown now that like it affects mollusks. Um, They're so rattled. Um, Other fish, um, the reason this film came to be is because seals, uh, after a seismic survey in the late 70s, uh, all the seals in the Arctic in that area were deaf. And the Inuit would uh, notice this and they're like, Wait, we're told that seismic surveys were safe. And then they found all these seals that are just deaf and can't hunt and are just kind of uh, li- the literal sense of the word dumb uh, on on the ice. Um so they would be able to sneak up to onto them and then they they found that they were deaf and so they thought they were you know they had some bad spirit so they would not eat them or uh hunt them anymore so it really affected a lot so they were like you know maybe seismic surveys are not so safe and a recent study uh well maybe not so recent now i think it's two or three years old which is good that there's probably more studies but a, a survey was done off the coast of Australia. And so some marine biologists went out and they took water samples before the survey and then right after the survey, and they found that it literally killed phytoplankton. So 50% of the phytoplankton were not there afterwards or were damaged. Um, So if you think about that, that is... If you know anything about marine biology, that's the basic building block of the food chain in the ocean. And so if uh, a seismic survey is knocking out half of the food chain, um, you can imagine the ripple effects that that would have on the ecosystem. Mm. Ian, I think you made a really great point there that it's happening in the ocean and it's happening quite far away and from a lot of people. And obviously you've mentioned the Inuit have a real awareness from what happened historically with the seals and you yourself became quite aware of what was going on. But when did you realize that by making films or a film that that could be a really great engagement tool because you can pass that out to other people to get them to begin to see what maybe before was a little bit more unseen? Yeah, well, I think that's why I want this film to have such a critical mass of viewership because... A, people don't know that narwhals are real, <laughs> and B, they've never heard of seismic surveys and um, don't know that the the threat that those surveys actually pose to um, all marine wildlife, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so the film is a way to like viscerally show and uh, have experts, you know, sonic experts weigh in on the effects of these, uh, surveys. Um, and you know, work, there's so many great, um, nonprofits out there like Greenpeace and, uh, Amnesty International or I don't know more, or a big one that has been, uh, effective at getting the word out about these seismic surveys is Oceana and through, you know, grassroots uh, municipal engagement along the Atlantic seaboard, they were, they were able to convince President Obama to ban seismic surveys off of the Atlantic coast because it affects fisheries, because it affects you know, tourists and income of those uh, coastal communities. Um, but that doesn't stop them from continuing these surveys in, in, say, international waters, which uh, are not as governed by um, uh, any country or the UN. Uh, You know, the maritime law is much different than uh, landlubber law. Um, So there's, there's a very real need to get the knowledge out there to mass populations and citizens and voters and conservationists that this type of uh, invasive 
exploration of the subsea floor is uh, very detrimental and, uh, you know, like our overfishing, uh, unsustainable overfishing, these, these things uh, are not recoverable. You know, there's a tipping point in everything where if it's continued at the scale or increased, like uh, I'm sure is happening, um, these bedrock species won't uh, be able to recover. And so if we think about the, you know, the far reaching effects of this, it's really important that a lot of people know about this, care about it, and are active against, uh, hopefully, in my opinion, against uh, continued seismic surveys. And one, one thing is I, I have a, a seismic survey manager, uh, a woman that worked on these ships for uh, over a decade and was in charge of these things. And the industry itself thinks that they're completely safe. They're like, oh, we slowly ramp up the decibels and we look for signs of whales on the surface with binoculars and we won't you know, do these blasts when there's whales directly in the area. So they believe that it's very safe and it's just like, oh, you know, we're just doing a survey of the subsea floor. Uh, we just happen to be using the loudest man-made noise on earth. Um, and so this uh, Sherry Cronin is her name and she, uh, I reached out to her to interview her for the film and she was of that same, like, this is a completely safe uh, industry and uh, we take into consideration all the safety protocols that are necessary. And then I sent her some of these studies that I just mentioned about, you know, before and after uh, samples and some of the effects of uh, migratory changes in narwhals getting entrapped in ice and mass pods dying off. And she read those um, scientific papers and then uh, agreed to be interviewed. And she had completely changed her mind and with her knowledge of the industry and had been like, wow, I actually don't think seismic surveys should happen in Baffin Bay and maybe should be you know, revisited in other uh, ecosystems and other, uh, other plans for these surveys. Yeah, I think you touch on it really nicely there that just a conversation with some evidence that's backing you up can really change a person's point of view if they're willing to listen. And I think there's a massive history in film and the media playing a part in widening people's views and opening people's eyes to some of these things that are going on. So you've already told us that, you know, Narwhal's Wake is the film that you're making, but where did the idea of the film come from? So the origin of the idea for this film really came from kind of a funny story. I um, was, I just returned from Burning Man and was staying at Esalen. Uh, the Esalen Institute is this like a intentional community that's credited with bringing yoga to the West and it's all organic farming is one of the best in the world. And uh, they also have some really great uh, hot springs and baths cantilevered over the ocean where you can watch whales and dolphins migrate by. And uh, anyways, I got there and um, a, a little narwhal uh, <laughs> um, finger puppet rolled out of our vehicle. <laughs> And we had never seen it before. It had just showed up. And so it sparked a conversation around narwhals. And um, we were staying with a friend, uh, Jamie, there. And she uh, overheard my buddy Raul and I talking very, you know, um, realistically about narwhals. And she was the one that originally was like, why are you talking about narwhals as if they're real? You know, they're mythological creatures. And we quickly disabused her of that, but I realized there was, you know, something there that literally very intelligent, very informed people um, can think that these creatures aren't real. Um, and so I s took that narwhal finger puppet and I did Adventures of Narnar. -Nar. <laughs> 
And uh, so I took that finger puppet around the world. I, at the time, I was doing adventure travel uh, for Men's Journal. And so I was going to all these like really cool different places. And so I would take a photo with Narnar and his travels. And then uh, I went to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. It had just reopened. And in the basement, I found a amazing collection of narwhal tusks yeah. and learned that you know the danish throne is actually made of 36 i think or 70 72 or something like that of narwhal tusks the entire throne the seat everything is a narwhal tusk um and that the the british monarchy i think queen elizabeth the first she spent a thousand pounds once on a narwhal tusk. And at that point in history, a thousand pounds would have built an entire castle. So the, these tusks were quite valuable, coveted and traded and bought and sold throughout uh, Europe. And so I had this Narnar and uh, Hugh was really enjoying himself at the Rakes Museum. And uh, on my flight back over, um, back to the U.S., uh, somewhere over the Atlantic, um, Narnar jumped off of the plane and swam back up to be with his friends in the Arctic because I definitely lost Narnar <laughs> somewhere mid-Atlantic. Um, so then that started and a... Um, a friend of mine had, you know, learned about or had been following the adventures of Narnar. And so she uh, sent me this petition to be in uh, Clyde River in, in solidarity of support of Clyde River, which is this hamlet uh, of Inuit in Nunavut that were against seismic surveys happening because they thought it would really hurt the narwhal. Mm. So I signed the petition and then uh, went down a bit of a research hole, uh, secretly cr created a, uh, a Kickstarter project to be able to fund me going to interview and film uh, some of these people uh, fighting uh, for the voice of the narwhal. Um, did that and was successful in that and was able to take a small crew of other documentarians that I'd been working with uh, to Toronto, where the first big case was happening, where uh, Jerry Natanin, the mayor of Clyde River, and a consortium of uh, nonprofits had banded together around him to hire a constitutional lawyer and take the case to the National Energy Board that the Inuit had not given their consent to this survey. Mm -hmm. And by withholding their prior informed consent that this uh, proposed five-year seismic survey for all of Baffin Bay, which would be every 10 seconds, 24 hours a day for five years, uh, they did not want it to happen. And so they presented their case to the National Energy Board, and then I was able to be there for that and meet uh, Jerry and his cousin Sandy and some of the Greenpeace representatives that were working on this project um, for Inuit rights. And from there, the film grew over the years and over time, and uh, we ended up, uh, Jerry ended up taking the case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and it took five years, and it uh, was unanimous in their decision in support of uh, the Inuit not giving consent to this survey, uh, mm. seismic blasting. And so that's another thing that's really needed in these days of, you know, marine conservation and documentaries and, you know, the state of the environment in general are, it's very good to have a documentary with a happy ending and that these animals, for at least the time being, are safe uh, from, well, they still have, we still have to, they, they and we still have to worry about climate change, but uh, hopefully they won't be bombarded by 
atomic bombs going off every 10 seconds. So there's something uh, to be celebrated there and uh, to give hope uh, and an example to other indigenous communities or any community of like how to go about um, potentially protecting and conserving uh, different ecosystems and wildlife. Wow. And that's amazing because you've been working on this project for so, so many years and to have seen all of this happen. So how, well, the first thing I wanted to actually ask was why did you call the film Narwhal's Wake? So the the name for the film is The Narwhal's Wake. Um, I don't know if it's maybe too clever, um, but it's the double entente. <laughs> So the narwhal's wake could either mean, you know, like a uh, Irish wake, a funeral, mm -hmm. and a bemoaning of the loss of this species, mm -hmm. or it could be uh, the wake left in its path and the ripples and the, the way it's changed uh, other people's lives and its continued uh, ability to swim in its Arctic waters. Um, that wake... And um, and one other meeting, but I'll let I'll let you figure it out. It's fun that you should say that because I think because literally since we heard about this project, we've been like, what does it could be this? It could be that. And then the other one was like, it's the awakening of the narwhal, awakening of people to know they're real. <laughs> so many different things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, awakening to the existence of the narwhal. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I wanted a, a title to be evocative of multiple different things because it's also such a, it's a many different stories coming together in this like, m you know, magical, mythical uh, unicorn of the sea. But it's really also about, you know, yes, that this animal, this bellwether animal, but it's also about climate change. It's about Inuit rights. And it's about, you know, untappable oil and oil spills in the Arctic and how they have 0% chance of being cleaned up and are 100% uh, you know, forecasted to happen. So um, all those different things coming together and, uh, and really deftly weaving all those different um, storylines mm -hmm. so it's not overwhelming but it's also very informative and, you know, like intersectional feminism, there's intersectional um, environmentalism. And so it's a lot of different um, sp specialized um, fields that uh, come into play um, that either will uh, guarantee uh, or... I guess not the continued survival of, of this very, uh, very, I, guess, I would say, at risk species. Um, they're not endangered currently. They're not listed. But it's also like we don't really know their populations. They're estimated to be either 100,000 or 300 or 250,000. Um, it's very hard to do surveys or get an accurate count of these things. So they're, um, they're near threatened is their um, designation currently. But the aim is that they don't get any worse than that and they only improve, like with many yeah. other species. Yeah, let's not go to endangered, please. Um, but no, I think you've definitely hit the nail on the head with the title because, like you said, you wanted it to be evocative. But I think Hannah and I have had a fair few conversations over coffee and dinner just about the title um so you've got you've got our minds turning with it that's great to hear can i ask you other than like you said trying to fit all these different stories and people and intersections of culture along with conservation into this documentary what are some of the challenges that you face trying to make this documentary oh so many and it's very surprising because it's such an amazing um story and creature um but i've had to mostly crowdfund uh, this project which and fund it through my working on other commercial productions so 
it's pretty much self-funded. Uh, I've been sponsored um, by some companies uh, for my Arctic voyage or expedition. I've um, yeah, it's it's really a, a growing community of my friends and colleagues that have really supported this film um, and funded it as well as in kind donations, like all my camera gear is uh, donated and for, you know, rental for use um, by my friend Raul uh, Gastia Zoro and his company, Black Powder Works. And then I somehow by all the convoluted ways in the world. Um, Robert Redford's nonprofit uh, really is a big supporter of the film. And so I'm fiscally sponsored uh, by the Redford Center. And then uh, I've had some meetings with uh, Appian Way, which is Leonardo DiCaprio's production company. And they're really interested in the, in the film. And he's a really big uh, Narwhal fan. <laughs> One of his documentaries has him on the flow edge uh, interacting with narwhals for the first time in his life. And you can tell how um, captivated uh, uh, he is. And so it's like a kind of a chicken and egg situation where I need funding to be able to get the film to a place where uh, Leo or I guess Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, <laughs> I don't know him that well. Uh, would actually see the film and then he could, uh, you know, if he wanted to be involved in the film at that point, they, he would be the executive producer and perhaps narrate it. Um, so there's all this like interest around the film and knowledge of the film and it's just been a long journey. Um, I, because of like the immediate threat that the narwhals face with seismic blasting going forward when I was first uh, starting the film, I really wanted to turn the film around and get it out there within like six months or eight months or a year. And uh, I think it's, it's now nine years. And I had a, a executive advisory board of all these um, uh, different filmmakers and uh with like Josh Tickle and Cynthia Wade and some other um, documentary directors. And as my advisors, uh, Josh w Tickle was uh, uh, very, he's like, well, yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you want it to be done in one year, but uh, you really need to think about this. Uh, it's probably going to take you five to 10 years and you need to be committed to this project for uh, the long haul. And so that's what it's become. It's where uh, I, the film is in edit right now. I've raised some funds through a GoFundMe recently to get the film to a rough uh, point. And then from there, uh, perhaps a Netflix or an Amazon or, uh, or uh, I'd love to like premiere it at Sundance or something like that. Um, everything is virtual now, so we shall see. Um, mm. But yeah, next year I hope to actually have the film out. Um, and the funny other part is like it's very expensive to film, you know, especially in the Arctic. So raising funds to do that was difficult. But uh, it turns out most people don't realize how much work is actually in the edit. And so I have like four terabytes of footage mm. of all these different amazing interviews around the world. Um, and now it's time to put all that together with sound and archival research and uh, all these other things that really add up. Um, most of the people that have worked on this film have like donated their time for free in kind. And there's also, that's great and all, but I also really want to support people's livelihoods and actually pay them for the quality of their work. And so that ends up uh, becoming kind of expensive. And uh, so, yeah, some finishing funds for the film are really important. And I, I think, and I, and I, anything is possible, right? So let's go. I think that's totally true. Anything you said is it possible. Now. It's, yeah. It's, it's in the realm of possibility, and you've said it. It's an aim. Let's go for it. I am the kind of person that emails prolific BBC people and says years ago, excuse me, can I come away with you and work for you? And they say, sorry, not right now, but 
if you don't ask, you don't get. So I think putting it out there that anything is possible. And on that note, you've kind of picked up quite well is our listeners are probably thinking, where can I see this film? Obviously, as you've mentioned, it's not quite there yet, but I'm like thinking a year from now that I think we need to talk to you again and be like, where is it streaming? Where is it? Where can we see it? Um, But is there anything our listeners can do to get involved with the project or educate themselves more on narwhals? Um, Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, Happy to. Um, I have a pretty good website that I built called the narwhalswake.film. And there's some resources on there as well as links to some, uh, a trailer and some videos. Um, there is the, uh, it's on Facebook as the same thing, uh, the Narwhal's Wake. And then there's also Keep Narwhal's Real, which has a bit more knowledge and it's more of a social <laughs> awareness campaign that, <laughs> that, hey, the unicorn of the sea is a real thing. Um, so there's some fun videos on there. Um, at the Narwhal's Wake, on the other things, I, I also share a lot of uh, the research coming out around narwhals and new discoveries around them, as well as seismic uh, concerns. I have a GoFundMe going right now, and I'm sure uh, you can just search Finishing Funds for the Narwhal's Wake is the name of that GoFundMe. And, um, and it will also be in the show notes just in case anybody's really keen and wants to look at that. Great, great. And if people really want, I've got a short screener um, that includes a really beautiful animation that will be in the final film. Um, That's the Inuit legend of how the narwhal got its tusk, which is a really um, interesting legend uh, that's quite, uh, has some surprises in it. Um, and if people are interested, yeah, the narwhal's wake at gmail.com, you can get in touch with me and I can share that screener, but it's not for public uh, viewing. Um, uh, it's just a, uh, it's for funding purposes. Um, and there's also some uh, links to petitions um, and in order to keep it light and fun as well. I have a petition um, (laughs) to create an emoji. Uh, There's no narwhal emoji, right? (laughs) I was really hoping that. I hear so many people with these petitions and I was really hoping those were the next words out your mouth. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it takes me forever. I have to do, you know, if I want to do a narwhal emoji, I have to do a unicorn and the whale emoji. (laughs) <laughs> All right, a unicorn isn't even real. Uh, narwhal is. Why can't we have a narwhal emoji? Um, uh, narwhals, uh, luckily, in you know some kids shows that are like you know marine biology based. There's like a there's a number of uh, narwhal things coming to the fore, and so I think if you ask a kid these days, they'll know what a narwhal narwhal is. It's the adults that might not but they can inform you. So there is a bit more, um, you know, narwhal awareness happening in the culture. And I think that's a really good thing. And uh, so that'll be actually like the beginning of the film will mostly be about um, our, our love of the, this unicorn creature um, and how, how it's pervasive and popular culture but then also going into where it can come from and how narwhals are. I think they're going to overtake uh, the unicorn in popularity. (laughs) That's the dream, especially with the emoji. But yeah, having watched, been lucky enough, I feel very privileged to have seen that screener and those animations that you speak about. And I just, it, it was wonderful, I have to say. So yeah, thank you for sharing that with us to be able to see that. Certainly, yeah. It's a really cute uh, animation <laughs> with a semi-intense uh, background story, origin story. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's a very good way to yeah. hear a story, though, <laughs> is through animations and in that way. So, yeah, I think just your ability to storytell and is just amazing to me, and I honestly can't wait to see the full documentary when when it comes out. <laughs> Yes, of course. Me too. I'm also looking forward to it. It's been, uh, <laughs> I've, 
You can't see me right now because this is a podcast, but I actually have uh, a really big beard. And I actually started growing this beard just to go to the Arctic um, <laughs> for this project. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to be at some point up in the Arctic, so I better have a beard and stay warm. And now it's been <laughs> nine years or something. So I have a really big beard at this point, And my goal is to... Once this film is finished and out there in the world, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, anything is possible. So let's say uh, we're at the Oscars. My acceptance speech is really just going to be shaving my beard. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that so much. Right. We are definitely towards the end of the podcast now. Um, we've asked you so many questions and I feel like we've absolutely dug through all of your brain for knowledge as well as just your wonderful way of putting mm. things but is there anything that you would like to cover that we haven't mentioned or anything else you'd like to tell us about um well first off i just want to thank you both for uh this opportunity and the work that you do and you both seem <laughs> quite fascinating in your own rights and it's great to meet some some fellow lovers of edinburgh um I think we've covered quite a bit. I'm trying to think if there's another like knowledge that I could drop. Um, <laughs> let's see. You've the dropped so much down. already, though. I've dropped I mean, I'm so much more, knowledge. More ending knowledge. But yeah, if anyone's interested in actually helping out on the film, you know, I can always use uh, archival research and outreach and educational things. I love to. Um, put together packages for educational for classrooms um give talks on that uh i think it's a really great subject for kids um it's a fascinating one something they're already like into and um yeah there's some some like i said uh, some great little facts about narwhals that kids love um but yeah if anyone wants to reach out and uh can contribute or um, in any way or introduce or have an, uh, of avenue to, um, you know, augment this project in any way. It's very much welcome and appreciated. And I think one thing I've found in the decade long project is that, uh, it's not me. It's definitely a group of different people coming together in a common, belief and a a cause and that uh you know if you uh if you put your mind to it uh anything can happen you can uh create uh the change you want to see in the world and so i invite uh any listeners to uh, preserve magic on earth and uh let's keep the unicorn of the sea just that the narwhal and uh here on earth i think that is the most wholesome and wonderful note to end it on so i'm just going to say thank you so much for Coming. taking <laughs> the time to speak to us today and taking us on your roller coaster of a ride to get this documentary made and sharing first and foremost the pun of knowledge with us <laughs> because that's going to stay with me forever <laughs> but no thank you so much for your time hannah have you got anything else to add no i think that's about it and ian <laughs> thanks for chatting to us <laughs> um and listening to us if you're listening which i hope you still are and have a wild day yeah have a wild day guys have a wild day bye, bye. Thank you for listening today. As always, we have been Wild About Conservation and you have been awesome. Please do leave us a review. We would really appreciate it and we do read them all. To keep exploring with us, drop us an email or find us on our socials. All the links are in our description and the show notes. If you enjoy our show and want to support us, we are also on Patreon. Just one pound a month, 25p an episode, will cover our creation costs. And anything above that, we donate to charity. Thank you to those of you that are already helping us to keep creating. Our chosen charity for this season are the British Divers Marine Life Rescue, who are an organisation dedicated to the rescue and well-being of all marine animals in distress around the UK. Donations will go to training teams of volunteers and maintaining specialised equipment that is vital for their work. 
Don't forget to look out for our next episode next Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If we aren't there, do let us know. And remember, step outside and get wild about conservation. Bye. Bye. How do you get wild? Watching wildlife documentaries. Wildflower painting. Diving. Wild swimming. Ocean watching. Rock climbing. Bird watching. Listening to podcasts. Hill walks. Visiting a wildlife charity.